Hey everybody, welcome back to the Grognards Corner, and we are actually back in the corner again, and we are looking at probably one of my most beloved games of all time, Sixth Fleet from Victory Games, released 1985, Strategic Modern Day Naval Warfare. Sixth Fleet was the was the flagship and the first game of the Fleet series that would eventually go on to expand to second, seventh, fifth. There's one other one for the Caribbean. I can't remember that dirt. All right. Uh, and there were a lot of changes that went through the series over the years. Um, I'll go ahead and touch on some of those. One of the biggest changes uh, between Sixth Fleet and Second Fleet, which was the second game in the system. Uh, when Second Fleet rolled out, they, uh, they changed how the combat worked a little bit. And then changed it even more in Fifth Fleet, if I remember correctly. But the biggest thing that they changed from uh, from Second Fleet to or from Sixth Fleet to uh, to Second Fleet was uh, they changed the combat from a D6 to a D10, uh, which, as you can imagine, kind of really alters how combat works. In theory, the games can all be played together. Um, there are rules in Second Fleet for being able to combine it with uh, with Sixth Fleet, although they do say that if you do combine Sixth Fleet and Second Fleet together to use Second Fleet rules. Um, and after Avalon Hill collapsed in the mid-90s and got bought out by Hasbro, there was a dedicated group of players who have continued... Uh, the fleet series and have come out with basically a living rule book that that's been in works for you know 20 plus years uh, they've come out with several different expansions for it they've modified it they've updated it for you know ship new ship classes that have come out over the years they brought out new scenarios um there is a and it pains me to say this there's a yahoo group because for some reason they still like using yahoo uh that is you know this collective collected group of players uh that uh that are updating and you can find the living rule book and, and i had a copy of it at one point and i wished for the life of me i could remember what the what the name of the yahoo group is or what the name of the new uh fleet system is called but it's out there if you're really interested, shoot me a comment. I'll, I'll dig around and root around and, and dig it up. But uh, Sixth Fleet, um, as I said, came out in 1985. And I purchased this in 1988 uh, on my first duty station when I was in the Navy. Um, it kind of, it kinda, what, what really kind of pulled me in is that I was looking at the back of the box and it actually had the ship that I was currently stationed on in the game, uh, USS Duluth LPD-6, troop transport, landing platform dock, hated that ship. Uh, <laughs> and that's what kind of cinched it for me. And it got a lot of play when I was on the Duluth. Um, since I have such a strong connection to, to modern naval warfare because well when this game was being created and when this game was out and the entire fleet series was out that's when i was in i mean i'm a cold war warrior uh, this is this is the stuff i did on a day-to-day -day basis so i will try to limit any uh off-topic discussions and uh, rants I may go on because honestly anybody who knows me or has sat down and had a beer with me and asked me about my Navy days knows that I can go on for hours and hours and hours and hours about my stories. All sailors can. It's one of our great defining points. I'll try to keep that to a minimum and just kind of keep focused on the gameplay. This is not going to be a how it's played video. This is just going to be a straight up play video. So I'm not really going to go into a lot of the rules and everything. Um, I've kind of been finding if, as I've been doing the, the let's play videos or, or the, uh, the, the how it plays videos, um, I kind of lose something in the translation because I'm trying to focus on playing the game while... Uh, explaining the rules and I will will miss some of the rules and I'll miss some out on gameplay because I'm trying to trying to pay attention to two different things I'm not going to do that for this one this is just going to be a straight up play uh, this video I will go a little bit over how some of the mechanics work but uh, in the videos to come when I'm actually playing the game don't expect a lot of rules uh, to be covered at that point 
Um, now this is kind of a big map. It's two 22 by 33 maps, and I kind of had to jury rig uh, a, a kind of a shelf for my uh, for my table because my card table was not big enough for it. So I grabbed a cardboard box so I could. Uh, so I could slide it under there to give myself a little bit extra room because there are two units that just happened to be right off the edge of the map. It kind of annoyed me about that. But uh, so what we're looking at is we're going to be playing one of the intermediate scenarios. Um, the scenario name is actually a Gen Offensive. It's scenario five. This is not an advanced scenario. Um, one of these days I'm going to play one of the advanced scenarios, but that basically uses every ship in the game, miners, major, you know, NATO, Warsaw Pact, you know, Libyan, Egyptian, Israeli, Turkish, Italian, Spain, France, Moroccan, navies, um, the advanced scenarios can get kind of wild. Uh, I've never been able to play one because I've never been able to, one, have the space and time to be able to do it, and two, never have found anybody to play with me. One of these days, though. Um, <laughs> so, no logistics in this one, no TAC nukes, no cruise missiles. Um, this is just an intermediate scenario. We're just going to be playing the basic game and kind of got to know what's going on. And I love um, the Fleet series because they each scenario, they gave this massive, you know, several paragraph background for it. So I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and read over the scenario background just basically so everybody knows what's going on. And then I'll kind of point out after the video, I'll go out and point out where things are at and, you know, what the objectives are and what the overall flow of battle in my mind for both uh, NATO and well, U.S. because there is no no other other nationalities. U.S. and the Soviets are going to be. So if you don't like background information and don't really want to hear me ramble on, you may want to skip ahead a few few minutes. I may go in uh, after I've got the video edited and put in exactly how far to skip ahead. I may not. We we may see. Now you got to remember this is 1985, so just just keep that in mind. Okay, and I may go ahead and take the camera and shift it around and kind of kind of point and focus on things basically uh, a regiment of the Soviets 105th Guards Airborne Division has seized the island of Lemnos at the southern entrance of the Turkish Straits in the Aegean Sea fearing Soviet domination over the rest of the Aegean National Security Council has ordered Com 6 fleet to establish a strong US naval presence there immediately in addition the major airfield on Lemnos is to be destroyed by combined air missile and gunfire attacks in order to deny its use by Soviet aircraft. Now, Limnos, I'm not sure you're going to be able to see it. I'll, I'll, I'll focus in on it later. It's this little island right here. And as you can tell, it is definitely right outside the Turkish Straits. Currently, Com 6 fleet has only a meager strike, meager forces in the central and eastern Mediterranean. The frigates Stark and Thatch returning to Naples after escorting a tanker to Israel and the attack submarine Baltimore and Drum. Okay, so basically right here, we've got the Stark and the Thatch. And I got the, I think that's the drum right there, and the Baltimore down there. So that's the only NATO presence in the western or the eastern Mediterranean. And they're probably going to get blowed up very, very quickly. <laughs> we'll get into that later. Uh, in the western med, shift it over to the western med. Uh, Com 6 Fleet has readied task groups 60.2 and 60.4 for an eastward move into the Aegean. Task Group 60.2 currently replenishes in Naples, consisting of the aircraft carrier Nimitz, the cruiser Texas in California, and the destroyers Barney, Mahan, and Comte de Grasse. Attached to the Nimitz is Carrier Wing 8, consisting of two F-14 Tomcat squadrons, the Black Aces and Jolly Rogers, two F-18 Hornet squadrons, the Marauders and Sidewinders, one A-6 Intruder squadron, the Black Panthers, one EA-6 Prowler squadron, the Guardias, I think I pronounced that right. One E2C Hawkeye Squadron, the Gold Hawks, and one S3 Viking Squadron, the Duty Cats. In addition, a squadron of US F-16 fighters is stationed in Sigonella. Okay, so Task Force 60.2. Let's see, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? In Naples. Okay, so Naples, Italy. Right up here. Right here, and we're using the task force marker for that. And if we look down here on our task force, I'll zoom into this later. 
uh, for Task Force 2, which is the Nemesis Task Force, where we have all the ships of that Task Force. Also, Task Group 60.4 has just entered the Mediterranean. It's currently on port visit to Cartagena, Spain. Uh, the force is a surface action group consisting of the battleship New Jersey. <laughs> um, I was a weapons technician, a weapons expert in the military, and I worked on naval gunfire systems. Oh, the 16-inch 50 was the pinnacle of that, uh, <laughs> that job, so I have a love for battleships. Uh, the cruiser Biddle and destroyer Sims and Merrill. And Cartagena, Spain is right there, Task Force 1. It doesn't matter what you name the task force as long as you have, you know, the counter matching, you know, the task force display. And there's the ships of task group 1, or 60.4. Uh, let's see. In position to support these two task groups are two attack submarines, the permit in Boston, a uh, permit in Rota, Spain, and Boston patrolling off Malta, and a single destroyer, Deo, Currently attached to the Naval On-Call Force Mediterranean, nav -Oc formed I love the military's acronyms, and display, deployed in Toulon, France. Um, performing surveillance throughout the Mediterranean uh, region is a squadron of P-3C Orions, the Eagles. The Soviet Black Sea Fleet has received intelligence of the pending U.S. move and has withdrawn most of its surface forces from the Western Mediterranean. Two strong SAG, surface action groups, have formed in the Eastern Mediterranean to block the movement of U.S. forces into the Aegean. The first SAG, currently refueling in Tartus, Syria, consists of the cruiser Kirov and Ketch, and the cruisers, and I'm going to butcher these because my Russian is absolute crap, uh, Savrominiev and Kulakov and Frigate Reskiv. The second SAG, currently repl replenishing in Darna, Libya, consists of the aircraft carrier Minsk with an attached squadron of Yak-36 Forger A Vestal aircraft. To call the Minsk as a carrier is a misnomer. It's not really a true carrier. It can only operate VTOLs. Um, it's basically a cruiser hull built with a landing deck on it. And that's just why it only has one squadron on it. Uh, the cruiser Azov and destroyers Otlichny and Zakharov and the frigate Rityev. God, I'm butchering those, I know it. Uh, in addition, uh, a strong force of Osa fast patrol craft are patrolling, performing short patrol duty around Limnos. Six Soviet attack submarines are also under the Black Sea Fleet headquarters control and have been ordered to intercept U.S. task forces in their eastward movement. One ultra-modern Oscar with 24 SSN-19 missiles, each with a 300-mile range. One Charlie II with shorter-range SSN-9s. One 45-knot Alpha attack sub. One Victor III. One Foxtrot. And one Tango. In addition, directly under the Black Sea Fleet controlling in Sevastopol are three large squadrons of Tupolev-16 Badger G Bear Bomber ship attack aircraft plus numerous reconnaissance electronic warfare support aircraft. All right, so that's the situation. <clears throat> now let's take a look at the special rules real quick. Um, all units can move into and through hexes of all countries, so don't have to worry about neutrality. Soviet T-16 air units cannot activate from any hex except Sevastopol. Basically, they only the airfield's only big enough to be able to support the Tupolovs. All units can enter the Turkish Straits without restriction. U.S. and Soviet surface and subs can end their activist status only in uh, base hexes of their respective nationalities. All right, so you can't stop in a base of another nation. Um, Nimitz must enter the central Mediterranean zone by game two and can never re-enter the Tyrian Sea zone for the remainder of the game. So the Nimitz right here in Naples has got to make it into the central med by turn two, easy enough, just go straight between Sicily and Italy, and has got to operate in here, at least operate in the central Mediterranean. They can never never uh, slip back westward. Uh, although I suppose they could move up in the Adriatic. Now, I don't know what they'd want to. Okay, victory. <clears throat> Game length, 10 turns, and US player receives victory points for getting his surface units into the Aegean Sea Zone. Which is, of course, right up there around Turkey and Greece. Uh, New Jersey and Nimitz are worth two victory points each, and other U.S. surface units are worth one point each. U.S. player receives double the amount of victory points for each surface unit that ends the last game turn in Limnos, 
or the six hexes surrounding it. He receives a normal amount of victory for U.S. Surfer Forces that end the last game turn and any other hexes in the agency. He receives only one of these victory points, so you can't get, can't score him twice. At the end of the game turn, at last game turn, U.S. player adds a victory points and checks for victory. All righty. So, what does that mean from a tactical standpoint? Well, let's kind of let's, let's go ahead and take the camera and kind of look at what we got here. So let's go ahead and take a look. These are the U.S. task groups: Task Force One, Task Force Two, and. Here are the two Soviet surface action groups. Now, I'm using the same display chart for the task groups because the way the map is set up, I mean, it's set up so there's another player over there, and, well, I don't have another player over there, so I'm just going to go ahead and use the U.S. side for attacking task, uh, task, tracking task groups. Also, by the same token, here's the uh, aircraft carrier display. Now, technically, this is supposed to be for the uh, Ark Royal, which is a UK carrier, but since it's not in game, and again, since the Soviet carrier displays are on the other side of the board, um, we're just gonna use that to track the Soviet aircraft carrier, which really isn't an aircraft carrier. So we are basically have gotten the entire Mediterranean. Our furthest, most westward deployed unit is this little submarine right here in Rota, Spain. <sighs> And then, of course, we have the New Jersey Battle Group in Cartagena. We've got a submarine up here on patrol. We've got a destroyer up here in Toulon. We've got some P-3 Orions. And, of course, Task Group 1 with the Nimitz is in Naples. And we've got another P-3 Orion. And the U.S. has got a small smattering. There's the uh, submarine there. Another submarine there, and these poor, two little poor frigates. All right, now I am going to go off on a little little bit of a side note. Uh, I spent several years, up. Oh, there's the front door. Hang on a sec. I'll be right back. All right, roommates ordering a bunch of shit from Amazon. Always kind of seems to come at weird hours. Um, so anyways, my little rant. I spent a lot of time on Perry class frigates, which are what, what both of these are. This is the Stark and the Thatch. Both of them were sister ships to the ships I served on. Anybody who knows any type of uh, military history know that the Stark is the ship that took the uh, the missile hit in the in the mid in the mid eighties, killed a lot of guys, but uh, the crew was able to save her. I actually knew. One of the guys that was on the Stark when she took the missile hit, and <laughs> he was he was never really the same again. Uh, the the missile struck one of the crew compartments um, and didn't explode, which is really the only reason the ship didn't sink. But when it impacted, it sprayed all the fuel into the crew compartment, and a lot of the guys in the crew compartment just they just didn't have a chance because as soon as it slammed into it, all that fuel ignited. Um, my buddy, uh, who was on the Stark at the time, was actually in the crew compartment that uh, that got hit, but and this was like at nine o'clock at night. But he had ran up to the mess decks to get a soda and was on his way back to the the, the crew compartment when the missile actually hit. So he missed death by a couple minutes each way. I think he realized that, and I, he was never really quite the same again. Now, Perry-class frigates are good ships. They're great ASW platforms. They make mediocre anti-aircraft platforms. Two of them, however, surrounded by a main sag and several submarines. And submarine and all these naval assets up here in the Crimea. Yeah, if the Soviets want those two frigates dead, they're going to die. Um, I don't see them actually doing real much. Um, it's, 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 let's go ahead and restack these guys back up. It's, uh, yeah, it's going to be bad for those frigates. Uh, their first job is to probably try to head westward as fast as they can, try to hook up with the Nimitz task group. <coughs> um, the U.S. submarines... They will probably go sub-hunting. Uh, a lone sub on its own can take on a SAG, but it's probably just better if they try to go hunting those three Soviet submarines there. Um, as, we have, as, as we mentioned earlier, here is Lemnos, and there are a bunch of OSA patrol boats, about 10 OSA patrol boats patrolling in the area. 
Um, they will pro. I, I part of me, part of me is thinking maybe I should just say screw it, send those frigates up there to take out those osas. But I've dealt with osas before, and those osas can probably put a serious hurt on those frigates. So I think the best shot with my frigates is really try to hook them up with the Nimitz. I'll be real surprised if they can make it. Conversely, the Soviets have got these two Soviet subs out here, and. One of them's a pretty good one. I think the uh, Zvezda is 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 a is a Oscar, and the Skov. Eh, I think that's a, that's the Tango. Um, the Tango is probably going to get munched real quick. Um, and the Zvezda, she has the potential to be able to put some serious hurt on people. Those two submarines are probably also sacrificial lambs. Um. I don't know if I'm gonna. I, they could probably both gang up on the on the on the on the New Jersey battle group coming out of uh, out of Naples or not Naples, uh, Cartagena. Uh, or they could, you know, go after that U.S. sub and maybe that U.S. destroyer before she hooks up with somebody. So yeah, the the U.S. have got two sacrificial lambs out here in those two in those two frigates, and the Soviets have got a couple sacrificial lambs here in those two submarines. Although I think the submarines have the potential to do more damage. Um, as far as the two task groups go, so you got one of the Soviet task groups here, and the other one here. Um, since the Soviets basically have to keep the uh, keep the U.S. out of the Aegean Sea Zone, they're probably, both of them are probably just going to go ahead and collapse to the Aegean Sea Zone, maybe form a barrier, um, and just start popping missiles away. I mean, they're, they're on defense, so their onus is, you know, just shoot and kill as much as they can. From the air war perspective... NATO's got the advantage in fighters. I mean, really, the only way, the only thing that the Soviets really have for fighters is the 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 yaks, if you want to call those fighters, uh, on the Minsk. I mean, pretty much everything up at uh, up at up at the Crimea are all you know Tupolev bombers. So, I think the U.S. has four squadrons that they could put on intercept, but the Soviets have just got a lot of Tupolevs up there, and you know it's. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the air war develops. Uh, of course, you know, since the, since uh, the U.S. has the air, air fighter the fighter or the fighter superiority, establish air superiority, knock out anything that flies. Standard Soviets attack is with the Tupolovs is just going to be bum rush everything they can and just pour as many missiles into a battle group as they can to try to sink as much as they can. Submarines are going to be harassing. And the battle group is going to be screening. So that's basically, that, 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 that's how I'm seeing it uh, form up. Um, I will probably keep the Nimitz battle group in the Central Med for a while. I won't push them into the Aegean until, uh, until later in the game when I've you know, got more, if I get more naval and sea do air dominance. Uh, the battleship, New Jersey. She's going to just be straight beeline in it for Lemno, so there's no doubt about it. She's a battleship. Her big guns, Ranger 1 Hex, she's going to she's gonna go in there and do what she needs to do, and that's, that's shell the crap out of something. Yeah. I think, that's, uh, I think that's what the situation is. I think that's how we're going to look at it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get the, get the stand back over here. And go into a little bit of mechanics of how the game works for people who don't know exactly how the game runs. Um, for the most part, the game is broken down into a strategic air phase, which is you take your air units, and that's when you put your, your air units on intercept missions, on cap missions, on recon missions, uh, and things like that. Now, not all aircraft are capable of conducting or will you want them to have them conduct strategic air missions sometimes you want to save them just for direct attacks you know like the, with the Tupolev bombers you know the the attack bombers I'm not going to want to put them on a strategic air mission I'm going to use them to attack but with the strategic air segment normally both sides do their uh, air placement simultaneously and out of sight of each other uh, since I'm playing against myself I'm going to have to come up with a little different of a uh, 
mechanic for that what I'll probably do is just roll initiative and you know place units alternating back and forth and basically you've got this little chart right over here which has got all the different C zones in it and this is where you place your strategic so you know if you've got and if you want to do, you know, like reconnaissance in the central med, you'll take one of your units and you put it in, you know, recon. And depending on what the, fl the, the movement of the air unit is, and we'll go ahead and take a look at this, yeah, although probably taking a look at this yak is probably a bad idea because it contrasts so much with my skin. Let's grab one of the U.S. air units. All right, so the number in the upper right hand, this is a A6 attack aircraft, number in the upper left-hand corner? Or maybe it's the right-hand corner. Crap. One of the two top numbers is their movement. Depending on what their movement is, is how many zones away they can actually fly. So yeah, here we have right here, range of air units on strategic missions. So if their movement allowance is 60, they can go up to three zones away, uh, 40 to 59, two zones, 20 to 39, one zone, 19 or less, or only, only zone occupied. Um, so those Tupolovs, I can tell you right now, those Tupolovs have got a, 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 a movement of 60, so they can go up to three zones away. So with the say, so they start in the Black Sea. I mean, they can get as far as okay. So the the Aegean, Central, they can get in the Tyrian, yeah. So they can get so all the way up in the Crimean, they can actually on the first turn start hitting the Nemeth battle group. Um, reconnaissance helps with detection. Uh, you need to know where the enemy is before you can really start shooting at them. And that's where detection comes into play. Uh, there is kind of a limited fog of war. You know kind of where the enemy units are just by where they're on the, where they are on the map, but you don't know where exactly until you've detected them. There's mechanics for that and you get... Air, uh, air units on strategic recon, you can place uh, detected markers. If a unit shoots, you can place detected markers. If they're in your, your range, your limited or extended range, which is one or two hexes, you can detect them. So it, it, it's kind of a cat and mouse initially while you're trying to find where the opponent is. Because once you get that detection marker on them, you know, you can usually get a first strike in. Um, the cool thing is, is that uh, there are three three turns in a day, uh, so a.m., p.m., and night, uh, or morning, evening, and night, however you want to say it. Uh, at During the night turn, all the detection markers are removed, so you kind of lose track of where everybody, I mean, it's like, all right, you know where they kind of are, but you don't know exactly where they are, and you need to know exactly where they are so you can vector in airstrikes and, and missile strikes and all that other good stuff. Um, so that's kind of the strategic air phase. Uh, then you have the activation phase. Um, uh, there are three phases in the activation phase, and each phase you roll initiative to see who goes first. And you can choose uh, one group of units to activate. Now, the, the groups of units are surface ships, submarines, and air. So say on your first activation, as, as, as with NATO, uh, NATO wins initiative. All right, I want all my air units to go. So you'll do everything with the air units. Um, then it'll flip over to your opponent's turn. Your opponent decides, well, all right, I want to do everything with my submarines. So he'll do all his movement and attack with submarines. Then he'll go on to the second activation phase. And NATO, and then you roll initiative again. Say the Soviet player wins this time. It's like, all right, well, I did did subs last turn so or last phase, so I only have surface or air left. So we'll do air this time. And it kind of flows back and forth like that. I like that because it's a flexible... It's an I go, you go, but it's a flexible... You don't know exactly which group of units are going to be going next any one time, and you don't know if you're going to get back-to-back -back initiative rolls. So it, it, it gives more of a fog of war rather than a set U.S. air move, NATO, uh, Soviet air move, U.S. air attack, Soviet air attack. You know, it breaks that up into, into more of a command and control and a fog of war. Which I really like. Anything that breaks up a normal turn sequence by by adding in something that kind of mix th mixes things up is it, just absolutely wonderful in my book. Um, combat basically comes down if you're in range. Uh, well, when you activate a unit, you can move and attack with them. Sometimes you can attack twice. Uh, most attacks, surface to surface missiles. Uh, let's go ahead and grab one of these guys here. So here we have the Biddle. Now the numbers in the upper right-hand corner, 
Okay, so first of all, we'll just go over the counter numbers. Four is movement, three is defense, five is missile range, eight is missile attack. Um, that is anti-submarine warfare, local anti-aircraft, area anti-aircraft, and the one is naval gunfire. You don't see a lot of naval gunfire. So basically, you, you add up the, the factors. So this has eight missile factors at a range of five, and you add them all, add them all up for whatever stack is attacking with. And you can do it stack by a stack at a time. And whatever the target is... Um, and then there's a, there's a procedure where the, the defender gets to arrange his ships uh, however he wants because ships further down the line get to protect the ships that are above them. And this kind of represents the task forces of screening ships around the more important ships. Of course, you know, like with the Nimitz, your Nimitz is going to be at the very bottom with all the other ships protecting her. Um, and this comes into play because how you add up the area fire and local anti-air the area anti-aircraft and local anti-aircraft to get your defensive value i'm not going to get too deep into it because it, it gets kind of confusing but basically what you do is you look on your combat results table for how much defense the missile strike is is worth um also i should probably point out let's say if an attacker has like 40 missile points he can break those 40 missile points up however he wants on the ships in the target group so say for example you know, the, the Soviet player has got 40 points going against the New Jersey battle group. He could break, he could put 10 points on each ship. He could put 40 points all on one ship. He can break it up however he wants. That's how you figure out what your defensive, def, defensive role is from the area and local anti-aircraft fire. So say, you know, the carrier, the, the battle group that you're, you're, you, you have is able to generate, say, just for example, 9 to 14. So... You look on the 9 to 14 column and you roll it, and you look, there are definitely different uh, columns to roll on. Plus, there's, there's a lot of modifiers, pluses and minuses. So, this is the defense. You're looking at defense. Say you roll a 4 on the 9 to 14, that's a defense of 4. Now, that is the group's defensive value. You will use that as a modifier when the, uh, as a negative modifier when the attacker rolls against each one of your ships. So say for example we got that four as the as the defensive fire and say we go with the example I was talking about earlier where you know the Soviets had 40 points and we're putting 10 to each one of them. So each of one of the attacks would be on the nine to four column, but it would be at a minus four for the defensive fire on the dice roll. So if they rolled a six it would actually be a two which would be two points of damage. And you take that, you compare that to the target's defense. If it's less than half, there's no damage. If it's equal or equal to or greater than half the defense of the ship, it's damaged. And if it's greater than the ship's defense, um, it's destroyed. So let's take a look at the jersey again. Say the jersey was the target, um, and it got a two hit on it. Well, if we take a look at it, its defense is eight. So two is less than half, so there'd be no damage to it. Now, if for some reason she did get damaged, we'd flip her over, and if you notice, her numbers go down a little bit. So let's also take that same dice roll, and you roll separately for each ship, I believe. Anyways, um, so let's take a look at Merrill, this DD. Had she taken two points of damage, her defensive value is a three. Two is greater than half of three, but not greater than three. She would have been damaged and flipped over, reducing her values. So that's the basic way combat works. It's a kind of a two-tier. I kind of like it, um, where you roll the defense of the battle group or defense of the target, and that determines the dice roll of the, the, of the attacker. And that's the basic mechanics of the game. Um, there's there's some bookkeeping phases, and you know there's a, there's a few other aerial missions like mine lane, which I have a feeling we're going to be seeing in this one. Um, yeah, but that's basically it. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to start playing here real soon. There's a few rules I want to I want to go over, so hopefully in a day or two I'll actually get uh, get the first video of the gameplay out, and I hope everybody enjoys. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, you know where to put them. Um, I'm really looking forward to this one, guys. Like I said, uh, I will. I, I love this game. I, I enjoy Advanced Squad Leader. I love the fleet system. 
All right, so if that gives you an idea of where where the where the fleet system stands in my hierarchy of games that I enjoy, um, that's it. I'll talk to everybody later. I hope my mad rambling didn't didn't confuse or 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 turn off too many people. And hopefully, we'll see you in a day or two. See ya.